Estoy buscando un árbol que me dé sombra Porque el que tengo calor a mí me da Estoy buscando un árbol que me dé sombra Virginia. From its downtown location, this cultural center makes an educational, social, economic, and spiritual impact. Onilade created and produces the society's annual events, including Juneteenth, a freedom celebration, the Down Home Family Reunion, a celebration of African American folk life, and the Capital City Kwanzaa Festival. The Lake Folklore Society also offers cultural history tours, including In the Beginning, Virginia, along the Trail of Enslaved Africans. The Society presents performances of African dance, music, and theater, as well as engagement in the visual arts. And the Lake Folklore Society is operating in its 31st year. Onyade Janine Bell has won many awards for her work in the arts and as a cultural organizer, including the Teresa Pollack Prize for Excellence in the Arts, the Bell Women in the Arts Award, the 2019 Bridgman History Maker Award, and she was recognized as the 2020 Person of the Year by the Bridgman Times Dispatch. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Melanie Maldonado Diaz. We do share a last name. <laughs> um, Melanie is an activist, cultural organizer, and independent scholar. Since 2000, she has performed and lectured with several groups and projects in Chicago, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, California, Texas, and Florida. Melanie started the Biennial Bomba Research Conference and received a Diaspora Research Grant from the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. In 2011, she started a Lugares Históricos project, which highlighted black history sites in Puerto Rico and went on to create a first-of-its-kind community tours of these ancestral spaces. In 2019, Melanie began placing historical markers at these locations of importance for African diasporic gathering and traditional practices. Melanie is committed to creating access, building community, and helping families remember the legacies of their ancestors. Her Bomba research also explicates women's agency, the importance of textiles, genealogy, lineages of learning, songs as critical records, placemaking, and historic spaces of praxis. Her work in Bomba has been received, has received five mayoral proclamations and recognitions by Puerto Rico's House of Representatives. She serves as a board member of the Escuela de Bomba y Plena Tata Cepeda in Kiss Kissimmee and Alianza Center in Orlando and was one of the 2020 Women in Culture for the New Jersey-based Raices Cultural Center. Welcome, Melanie. I told you we were in the presence of brilliance. So I'd like to begin um, with a very open question, uh, if you will, to each of you tell us a little bit about yourselves and your family roots before we enter into your work. Well, thank you so much, um, everybody, for having me. I'm very honored to be with you as well, and I hope that we'll have a chance to chat a bit before we leave. Family roots. So that is um, a winding question for Africans in America, for Africans born in America. Sometimes we say African Americans. Sometimes we say American Africans. It just depends on how you kind of consider the direction of the roots and the pattern of the roots. Um, sometimes I say the boat dropped me off in North Carolina where I grew up. Um, and so 
uh, eventually after living various places I came to Virginia but even in coming to Virginia I feel that I was sent by spirit because of the roots that needed to be uncovered and reconnected so that new growth could happen based on uh, the value of the untold stories. Um, we did some DNA testing in our family and uh, on uh, the matrilineal side, we learned that we were Mende and the Mende people are in Sierra Leone primarily. Um, and then on my father's side, the lore is that we're Igbo. So until we know further, I accept. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, similar expressions, facial expressions and so forth in family members and in Igbo people. So it, it, it works because uh, you've called me by my divine name, Omilade, but then the end of it is Belle. Well, Belle is a Scottish name. So that's somebody that owns some people in my family line. So there's a lot of, uh, of reconnecting again that needs to happen. And you said it so poetically, remembering not only recalling, but remembering into wholeness our true selves. Thank you, uh, Isha and Samia Cultural and Alicia for uh, having us here today. It's really special mm -hmm. and I'm honored to be here. Well, it, again, it's a complicated question for people who have been colonized. Mm -hmm. And it is always an emotional response. So forgive me if, I, if my voice quivers, but it's special to be here for all the reasons you laid out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I am a third generation Puerto Rican, uh, living outside of the islands of Puerto Rico. My four grandparents were born in Puerto Rico and my, uh, all made their way to the States and, and settled in Chicago. So my parents were born in Chicago, I was born in Chicago, my children were born in Chicago. But um, I always identify as Puerto Rican. When we get to that box, because you know, I, I don't even have to explain to most of you the, the issue of explaining ethnicity versus race to folks, right? Because they always, oh, you're Puerto Rican, that's your race. <laughs> well, I, I always have to unpack that. My children have uh, unpacked it and they understand and when they get uh, a little check mark that decides for them on their um, paperwork at school, they always challenge it because they know we always identify as other or mixed because we understand our roots as a genealogist. I find it incredibly important to remember mm -hmm. these stories, to, to connect with our ancestral energies and our ancestral uh, callings. And so in, my, in our family, we're Puerto Rican because that is the, the recent history but as a genealogist, I've been able to uncover some of those lineages that go further back. Mm -hmm. And so my maternal line is archaic or ethaico, which were the pre-Tainos, the First Nations people of Puerto Rico uh, that were there before the Tainos came from South America to Puerto Rico. However, I am of mixed race, and, and even the word race is complicated, right? and to some doesn't even exist, but it has its, its, its purpose, its utility, so I'll use it here. Um, but in terms of our event and in terms of the work that I do with Bomba, I'm also very much in touch with my African ancestry. And in our family, unlike a lot of the people that I work with, with their genealogies, because my haplogroups or my, my matriclan or patriclan or maternal lines my matrilineal or patrilineal, there are lots of different words, so I'm just putting them all out there. Um, they don't go back. We know that they don't go back. The, the, the documentation supports that, uh, and DNA proved it for us later. But like many Africans in diaspora, 
I have, I didn't expect to be able to make a connection with the mother continent, but I did through one of the DNA testing companies. And so I can identify one of the ethnic groups that represent my ancestors, and that is the Urhobo people of the Delta region of southern Nigeria. And so I'm always grateful for all of, or all my ancestors that um, called me forth and pushed me to the, to the work that I do today. And the First Nations, for sure, and my African ancestors are the ancestors that I feel really have molded me in my purpose in this work and what brings us here today together. Thank you for such richness. Wow, beautiful. We're going to return to this, to this ancestral work of remembering that both of you do. Um, and it's fascinating sort of the parallels that, that can be seen of both of your works. But I'm thinking that before we do that, let's uh, bring to the forefront uh, the cultural traditions and the music and the dance forms that you practice and that we're going to see here today, uh, West African dance and afro Puerto Rican bomba. And uh, perhaps tell us a little of how, how they intersect with the history and legacies of enslavement and resistance. Well, it's important, uh, again, to reconnect uh, ethnically and culturally and traditionally. Um, for us at the Elegba Folklore Society, and of course uh, the word Elegba comes from the Yoruba cosmology of southwest Nigeria and parts of Benin and uh, Togo as well. Um, but we have chosen, so we, so we choose to share some aspects of uh, Yoruba culture and traditions and what we present. Sometimes to present it as it is, sometimes to present it as a way of opening a path to a story that we want to tell or to uh, dots that we want to connect. Um, but then in our dance and music, we've chosen uh, the Manding cosmology, the Mandingo who are uh, in other parts of West Africa. We're going to talk about that a little while later. I don't want to steal my own thunder. Um, and in part because it was the djembe drum and the djembe orchestra that you'll hear from today. You see some on the stage here uh, that came to the United States uh, early on and was a way that people could begin to know something about traditional instruments and, and the concept of an orchestra that's not Eurocentric. And sometimes when uh, we're around people and they say, oh yeah, we're going to beat some drums today. And I say, no, we're not. We're going to play them and make music. The music is very complex in its polyrhythms. Listen and feel what we have. Um, and so we share uh, the stories that are in the dance and the music through the djembe orchestra and then sometimes bring in the stringed instruments that are going resonated, the gonies and the choras and the uh, um, music uh, instruments such as that, the balaphone, which of course is the grandmother of the xylophone and the marimba. So that people can see logically that there's a connection, but there's so many of us who don't even think about African music in any sort of orchestral manner. They don't see that there is complexity. Um, I remember even being in a, in a uh, grant panel uh, meeting where, of course, we can't speak. We can only listen to people speak about us. So I had some problem about that from the beginning, but I digress. So. <laughs> So this particular time, we among the things that we put in the proposal, we wanted mirrors, because we're dancers, so that we could see it before you all see it. And one of the panelists said, well, I don't really understand why you need music. You're just jumping up and down to some drum beats, you know, the, the ooga booga approach, to classical African dance. Uh, various African dances are the roots of all forms of movement that we know. 
uh, African drum orchestras and African music. It's the root of all forms of music that we know. So when you look at Eurocentric forms of music, they have a mother and they have a father and the mother and the father in the heart of the world. I really enjoy listening to you. <laughs> I need you to repeat the question again. <laughs> I got lost in the kind of thing. Thank you so much. Uh, can you tell us about the, the cultural traditions of music and dance form that you here? practice <laughs> we're going to see you today? And if it seems um, it comes into, into your, into your uh, answer, how they may interact with uh, the legacies of enslavement and resistance. Well, Bomba, that's why we're here. That's why I'm here. That's why my friends are here from Puerto Rico and, and our friends here in, in Virginia and the DC area. Bomba, it, it's, we're, we're still learning. We're still learning so much about Bomba, as are mm -hmm. all of us in the diaspora, learning about our African ancestor, ancestral traditions and uh, histories and histories. In Puerto Rico, there is not even yet a consensus on, on when Bomba kind of came to be in Puerto Rico. But I can tell you what the research says. And uh, according to Hector Vega Druet, and the work that he's done, he says that the oral tradition in Loisa, Puerto Rico, dates Bomba back to the, the Festival de Seises, or the, the Seis Festival, in San Juan in the 1600s. Now there's written documentation of Bomba as early as the 1700s, mentioned in, in different written documents, archival documents. So we know it's been in Puerto Rico for several hundred years. And we definitely identify it as our African legacy and heritage in Puerto Rico. Again, the narrative, the, the, the consensus uh, uh, around the narrative regarding when and where Bomba was practiced and where it came about, how it came about, is always tied to the period of enslavement and the experience of enslavement and the opportunity as in many other diasporic communities for it to serve as a tool of communication and therefore resistance within groups living together and groups living apart um, and just all the myriad of circumstances that can manifest in that way. However, and, and I hope that my work is part of, of a, an intervention in this way. In Puerto Rico in particular, we have a very unique and important history that often gets um, kind of looked over. And that is that in the 1700s, the Spanish colonial government invited formerly enslaved people, cimarrones, Libertos, free people of color throughout the Caribbean to come to Puerto Rico through a cedula, which was an invitation. You come, you convert, you become Catholic, we'll give you land. You come and populate our island, produce, be part of building this uh, community. And they did. They came. And there were so many formerly enslaved and free black people in Puerto Rico that they created the first town of free blacks on a Caribbean island in the late 1700s called San Mateo de Cangrejos. And it was right outside the capital city and it was such a, a, an important population and such an important community with uh, growing power economically and culturally and socially that the colonial government said we need to stop this. Mm -hmm. This can't be. So they eviscerated the, the infrastructure of that community and took it away. Renamed, even, even taking away the name and putting the name 
of a uh, colonial uh, military leader. When we talk about living in a militarized state, we know that, right? Just from living in this country, what it's like to live in a militarized state. And that history has almost been erased. However, <laughs> there's evidence, repeated evidence in the archive that indicates that these libertos, these gente libre, these uh, free people of color throughout Puerto Rico, but particularly in the metropolitan area near the capital city, engaged in bomba. And so bomba in Puerto Rico has a narrative that's deeply based in the period of enslavement, but it also has a powerful story in our history of freedom and power and agency and uh, economic and community growth. Now, part of eviscerating that community, because by 1800, this town was, uh, was founded in 1773, right before the Haitian Revolution. So the Haitian Revolution mm -hmm. comes right on the heels of that, mm -hmm. right? By 1800, about a little bit more than half of the island was now black. Mm -hmm. And that got people nervous. Mm -hmm. So they issued another one, scrambling, trying to say, like, we need to tip the scales again. We need, you know, Europe. We need you now. Come on in. And they issued another cedula. And uh, that's where we get this huge influx of Corsicans and people from Ireland and uh, many other countries throughout Europe to then blanquear, to whiten the island. And it worked because today we only have about 27% of people on the island with a matrilineal DNA that goes back to the mother continent. And so the strategy worked. They eviscerated the town, they erased our history of Bomba as an experience of free people and kind of couched it, right? The history is written by the oppressor. And so our history is always that bomba happened during the period of enslavement. But I'm here to tell you today, there were pe free people who were also doing bomba and were perpetuating the tradition that we know and love today, and you'll see very soon. See, that's the thing, because it seems that even in spite of those conditions, that there were opportunities for people to stay connected with cultural forms. But in Virginia, it's a whole different ball game. I mean, the, the connections were cut completely. So that just added on to the disorientation that we already felt and we were already experiencing with our names gone, all of our traditions gone, do not, there are no drums. There was not a way that we could hide traditional practices inside Catholicism. That wasn't the primary form. Uh, there were more Protestants here. But then we had spirituals that could then become code songs and at least helped us, help us to reconnect in philosophy, um, in the fields with using the tools that we had, it became very rhythmic, which um, vexed some folks as well. Because I mean, we have to, who we, who we are culturally and who we are traditionally always lives inside. I mean, it's been conditioned, um, it's been, again, disoriented, it's been mixed up. Some of us look away from it and look to it and call it something foreign, but it's in here as a source of our strength. The key to our identity, our spirit, is all wrapped up in our culture. So even when some of us may not realize what we're doing exactly, because we can't articulate it, we feel it. And that's a, that's a lifeline. That's a form of resistance. To be able to even move my body in a way that satisfies me, to be able to go down to the Hush Harbor and sing the songs and 
clap our hands or put the wood together that we find and make things happen. It's salvation. And we've always had it. And we'll always have it. And so now your work along with ours is to help people to see that that's the truth. Can we dig then also into another area of erasure, say, of, of, of these forms and histories specifically related to women? Right? And thinking of tonight's uh, program and our Suba being here as an all women's um, MOHA group as well. Uh, and so, do, can you tell us a little bit about the role of women in the practices? That, that we're talking about, that you are engaged with, and maybe both uh, it, like the, the historical continuities and legacies into, into today. It's interesting because the story keeps changing. <laughs> and the more we learn, the more we realize we just didn't even know. And, um, what I can tell you is that when I, when I was growing up in Momba, my early years in Momba, about 20 years ago, the perspective that was given to me, the history, the, the, the explanations that were given to me were all male-based. Males did this, males did this, males did this. Women were not allowed to do this, that, or that. Only this. And something just seemed off about that to me. I just thought, how is it possible that a community tradition excluded women? How is it possible that songs, which I always feel are our Bomba history books, that these songs mention participation by women, but the narrative that I'm receiving contradicts our history books? And I I had to understand that better, and that is really what was a driver for me to research Bomba, to learn more about Bomba, because I felt absent in the history. My kind, my people, me, women, we were absent in how history was shared. And that, that pushed me to learn more. And the more I learned, the more I learned, and I'm still learning, um, that women have critical roles. And uh, a lot of what had been explained to me was that women sang and women danced. However, they did not interact with the drum. And they, what they did was that, this is the explanation that's been given to me, was that they created figures around the man as he interacted with the drum. And I saw that. I saw that in old videos. I saw that in a group that would perform um, in the early 2000s in their folkloric rendition of traditional bomba practice and I just kept thinking something's off here I can't put my finger on it but something's off and so the, I, I really began focusing on interviewing uh, the elderly because I said I have to go past the current generation of teachers even and I have to go beyond because something is getting lost in translation and the elderly and the elders among those elderly put me on and said, no, women did this, women did that, women sang, women, I even have heard women drummed, women composed, and this just opened up like a whole new world to me. And I, I began researching, looking at, looking in the archive, listening to songs, deconstructing the songs, continuing with these interviews so that I can piece together our story, our her stories. <laughs> and um, what I found in, in one of the areas in terms of textiles that I really focus on is in Aguas are petticoats. And so yes, women were extremely limited because we live in a patriarchal society. We live in a Puerto Ricanos, we live in a colonial state where on top of the patriarchy, you have patriarchy, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. more patriarchy, and mm -hmm. all of these layers of patriarchy really stifled women. 
And in one of the ways that I found that women resisted within Bomba was to create the subculture of textiles. It was a subculture that allowed them to meet together for a purpose related to that textile, to, to design, create, and, and influence their own textile. This petticoat, what they do, what they would adorn them with different materials, sequins, buttons, flowers, ribbons, lace, um, pocket, uh, I, I'm going to say the word wrong because my uh, brain wants to say it in Spanish and I can't remember that one either. Um, <laughs> but all just different ruffles, all kinds of ingenuity. And then they would show up at the bomba dances and because they did not interact with the drum, the, the moment of, of, the, of, of heightened intensity was when they delicately lifted up their skirt to reveal that amazing piece of, of fabric that they had constructed, that they had contracted a seamstress. And seamstresses were in demand because they wanted to get the best, the, the most outlandish, the most beautiful. Um, and some women would even take multiple uh, petticoats to a bomba dance and they would change every time they came out they had a new one on and so the reveal was the moment the heightened moment and it was an understanding among women and it was a way that they created agency for themselves and so if we think back to this time I'm just talking a hundred years ago I'm just talking 75 years ago um, that this was still happening when women I've, I've interviewed um, folks who have told me women were not even allowed to decide that they wanted to, that they could enter the, the bate or the, the dance space. They couldn't make that decision on their own. They had to be given permission because of the patriarchal stru structure. And so I've, I've even interviewed an elder who told me that men would take a handkerchief and go speak to, to the male partner of the, of the female dancer, ask his permission, and if he, was grant, if he was granted permission, he would dangle the handkerchief, not allowed to touch her hand, and she would have to grab the other uh, part of the handkerchief. And then she could go dance. And so if we think about being so constricted within your participation that you have to have all these layers of permission and distance to the other end of the spectrum, which is where we are today. And that, you know, a lot of these women who will be demonstrating Bomba for you tonight are part of island-wide political movements where they're using our drums of resistance to denounce all kinds of uh, atrocities against humans and against women. Women denouncing, using drums in acts of resistance to denounce acts against women. In Puerto Rico, we have a, a, a plague of femicide, the killing of women. Mm -hmm. It is a plague in Puerto Rico. And these women that are here tonight, they are part of the movement of resistance using our African ancestral traditions, our inheritance, our legacy to denounce these acts. And they take those drums and they shut down expressways. They, they're right in front of the governor's mansion. I, I mean, I'm gonna cry, it's, it's, they're powerful. And these drums are powerful, and our legacy, our African legacy, that, that in Puerto Rico demonstrate as bomba, all come together. And the participation of women, the, in 75 years, we've come from being so marginalized within our own tradition to now being the leaders, the, the, the primary constituency of Practitioners of Bomba, of leaders of groups, of teachers of Bomba, right now are all women. All women. So we talk about resistance in Bomba. We, we have overcome that patriarchy in a lot of ways. And in a lot of ways, we still have a lot of work to do, not because we haven't evolved. And I'll just leave those three dots right there. <laughs> We all have a lot of work to still do.
but we're but we're on a path because what we've already done and we're on a path because we're standing on the shoulders of our ancestors who want us to win um, I think for uh, black women in America even though we've come out of the American enslavement of African people it doesn't seem to be the exact same conundrum that you just described because I see women as being foundational, at the foundation of everything. Um, whether it's what's happening in the house, whether it's what's happening in the marketplace, whether it's what's happening with the children, whether it's how we're expressing ourselves with sass and self-determination. Um, I, I, I just see that foundation as being pervasive and hopefully being um, a light for younger women to also follow. I mean, certainly um, life isn't sugar-coated every day, but I see women as being strong and committed to um, upliftment and elevation in community through our artistic practices as well as through our social practices. Both, both of you lead organizations that engage um, with ancestral histories as we have been as we have been talking and with memorialization and commemorative acts. Mm. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that work and how you go about doing that and the significance of this reclaiming or remembering, as we're talking about, of these untold histories and historical sites? Well, for us at the Allegba Folklore Society, and I'm sure with other organizations, there are folks like Gay in this audience and probably others who do the work, lived, live it every day. And so you'll be familiar with uh, the Ashanti in Ghana and their uh, system of wisdom symbols that they call Adinkra. And one of them, of course, is the Sankofa, where we have to remember where we've come from to know where we're going. And, and that's the, the sensibility of the continuum of life. We're really not on a disconnect. We really just need to be on that continuum on that universal flow that we were born into. Um, so it's important to pay homage to our ancestors. Um, we didn't get here by ourselves. None of us got here by ourselves. Um, it's important to think about the richness of the traditions that were taken away from us, that in our work we help people to reconnect to and help us as well. Every day is a learning day. Um, so much in the material world, people take for granted. And they don't give value to even the simplest things that really have the most power. And so it's important um, to, to commemorate, to say thank you to somebody, people that we have not known, people whose names we may not know. And in doing so, now we're opening a path and a place for the children we see coming, who we may not know. But, but we're here in this present. And that's a huge responsibility to do all that we can do in the way that we can do the best we have with what we, what we have. So that we can represent those who have high expectations who came before us. So that we can share love with one another in being ourselves and, and communicating the histories and the histories, and by recognizing our part 
in creating the future that we seek. It's every day, all day. In terms of the commemorative work that I undertake through PROBA, which is a banner entity under which I do my cultural work, genealogy is an important tool for me to help people get past the immediate oral history that has been retained in their families, to use the archive to help them get a little further back, and then DNA testing to get us Get, help them get even further back than that and make, the, make meaningful connections for themselves. Uh, some of the other ways that um, Roba is commemorating is uh, through demarcating spaces. Now in Puerto Rico, it, it, it's beautiful here, the work that's being done here in Fredericksburg, in Richmond, and in many other communities nearby. In Puerto Rico, we lack a lot of commemorative work. And we have zero, and I mean zero, work around identifying and honoring spaces that were important to our African ancestors and other Afro-descendants in Puerto Rico. We have zero sites of importance that have been acknowledged and celebrated and commemorated. We don't have a culture of identifying demarcating, making visible these spaces. And so part of the work that I have done through PROPA is, uh, and I, I started doing this work 10 years ago when I took the conference that I started in Chicago, the Bomba Research Conference, which you mentioned in my bio, which started in 2005. 10 years ago, in 2011, I took the conference to Puerto Rico because I was interviewing more and more elderly and it was difficult to get them to Chicago. So I took the conference to them so that I could feature them as panelists and have them participate and tell their own stories. Because I, didn't, I could be the conduit, but I didn't want to be. I wanted people to hear directly from these primary sources mm -hmm. in the spaces where Bomba happened. And so universities will reach out to me all the time and say, bring your conference here. And I say, no, thank you. I would rather be at the cemetery. I would rather be in the Marquesina, which is a carport. I'd rather be on the town plaza where they had bailes de bomba and the festival de uh, the fiesta, fiesta patronal or the patron saint festivals in the town. I'd rather be on the beach. I'd rather be on the street corner where bomba happened. Mm -hmm. And so 10 years ago I started that work. And then in 2017 a devastating natural disaster eviscerated cultural spaces in Puerto Rico, personal spaces, personal domains. And for me, that elevated the urgency around this work. And I said, I cannot wait any longer to do something about this. Nobody else is doing it. It's got to get done. It's happening. And so through grassroots fundraising, we raised some funds. People sent in their $5, their $20, their $50, their $100. And we set up some plaques. And by 2019, I put in four plaques to commemorate spaces important to our traditional bomba practice in Puerto Rico, and that's what I'm doing. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure, amazing to be here, and looking forward to the rest of, of the program uh, today. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, boy.